Atari was blowing up on Lynx in 1990 on this episode of Game Boy Works Gaiden. Covering Lynx's 1989 releases was easy enough, given that there were just five of them. But moving into 1990 and beyond is a little trickier. Unlike with Game Boy's Japanese lineup, there's no public record keeping that keeps track of the specific dates on which any Lynx titles ship to retail. There's not even really any reliable info that pins any but a handful to a specific month the way Nintendo of America did for all its licensed 8-bit and 16-bit release. In short, all available release data on 1990's Lynx games amounts to 1990. While it might be possible to reconstruct something of a release schedule by poring over magazine reviews and advertisements, even that would be a vague approximation. It wouldn't account for print lead times, shifts in distribution schedules once review code was distributed to the press, and the fact that games were competing with three brand new consoles, Game Boy, Genesis, and TurboGrafx-16, along with NES at the peak of its power, all of which the press were likely to prioritize over Lynx. In short, a strict chrono gaming overview of Lynx is a fool's errand. I'm not that kind of fool, I'm afraid. But fortunately, this is Game Boy Works Guide In. It's a side story, which means I can afford to be lax. As we pause from time to time to look at Lynx's release library, I'll simply be grouping a given year's releases by themes, genres, publishers, that sort of thing, rather than attempting some sort of forensic endeavor to determine the exact release order. The point here is to get close enough and give a sense of what Game Boy releases had to compete with, not to perfectly reassemble the Lynx's history with magazine scans and newspaper clippings. And so we begin our look at 1990 with a quartet of games that share two elements in common. They're derived from arcade titles, and they were originally developed by Atari games. Given the Lynx's impressive power, how do these first-party coin-op conversions compare to those of the meager Game Boy? The first Atari arcade conversion in our lineup this episode is one we've already seen in action a couple of times on both Game Boy and Super NES, so there's no need to belabor the point. Paperboy was a huge hit for Atari with its authentic handlebar controls, and the NES conversion sold even better. The Lynx release was the one to get. Despite the overall sense of visual abstraction caused by Lynx's low pixel resolution, its graphics look far more detailed and organic than on either NES or Game Boy. The blocky awkwardness of Mindscape's Nintendo conversions is absent here, and even with its scaled-down screen objects, Paperboy on Lynx recaptures the essence of the arcade game. The hardware's widescreen format doesn't hurt either. It allows the player's avatar to ride toward the center of the screen, rather than being crammed into an awkward corner, as on Game Boy. The action plays out exactly as you'd expect. You pedal up the street, avoiding hazards as you attempt to launch newspapers into your subscribers' mailboxes. The neighborhood you traverse here is a chaotic madhouse, where you're beset by every imaginable hazard. Kids on bikes, skateboarders, runaway lawnmowers, poorly driven cars, open sewers, even the Grim Reaper himself. It's all nonsense, of course, but it's challenging and fun nonsense. It's certainly a lot more fun than the only other handheld version of Paperboy available at the same time, the meager Game Boy conversion. Maybe it's to be expected that Atari would favor its own platform in the process of porting one of its own arcade hits to portable systems, but did they have to be so obvious about it? Clax was Atari's entry in the puzzle game genre that everyone wanted a bite of following Tetris' success. I'm afraid it's not on par with Tetris, but then what is? It's not a bad game by any means. It is, however, sideways. Here, let's fix that. Okay, that's better. Yes, Clax is the first Lynx title we've seen to take advantage of one of the system's more unique features. Vertical play. Before Wonderswan, before Flip Grip, there was Lynx. Lynx was a groundbreaking platform in terms of accessibility. It included redundant A and B buttons, and many games could invert their screen orientation, allowing for ambidextrous use that put both right and left-handed players on equal footing. Clax is one of the few games that couldn't flip its orientation, and that's because it was meant to be played with the system held sideways. The D-pad is positioned above the screen, while the buttons, both left and right oriented sets, sit below. This might be a video gaming first, an arcade port that takes a coin-op built around a horizontal screen and turns it into a vertical game in its home iteration. It was almost always the other way around. It's an unusual inversion, but it makes sense. Lynx's limited vertical resolution, 102 pixels much smaller than even Game Boy's resolution, was ultimately a poor match to Clax's design, which evolves objects emerging from the background and sliding toward the player. Clax could have fit within Lynx's vertical resolution, but it would have been squashed and compromised. So instead, Atari reoriented the action, giving players a more dynamic view of the gameplay. This made for a great conversion of the arcade original. By comparison, the Game Boy version doesn't simply suffer from a lack of color, its pieces instead need to be distinguished based on their grayscale patterning, which diminishes much of Clax's visual appeal. Gameplay consists of colored blocks sliding toward the player along a conveyor belt. Or is that the fretboard of a guitar neck? The pieces need to be caught before they fall into a pit, 
and stacked in a grid along the bottom of the screen. This is, not surprisingly, a match three game. Line up three pieces of the same color, whether vertically, horizontally, or diagonally, and they vanish, awarding players points based on the complexity of the line created. A vertical line earns the fewest points, while a diagonal clear earns the most. You also earn enormous bonus points for clearing more than three blocks at a time. Plus, a combo that matches four or five pieces at once counts as multiple matches. That can come in handy because your objectives vary from level to level. Some levels want you to make a set number of matches, while others challenge you to clear a specific number of pieces or hit a certain score total. Dropping pieces and learning to hold and rearrange multiple pieces to customize your five block stacks is key to success in Clax. This is one of those games that showed up on just about every system imaginable, even monochrome systems for which its color-based gameplay was poorly suited, and even amidst all this competition, the Lynx version stands proud as one of the better adaptations. Clax wasn't a system seller on the level of Tetris, but it really does show off the strengths of the Lynx. It looks nice, it makes use of the platform's physical flexibility, and the sound chip does a respectable job of reproducing butt rock and guitar chords to drive home the notion that yes, you're totally wailing on a six string, or a five string as the case may be. Even more impressive is the Lynx's conversion of minor arcade hit Road Blasters. Best described as an updated riff on Midway's Spy Hunter, Road Blasters combines stunning speed with highway-based gunplay. It's a simplistic and frankly sort of mindless game, but that doesn't keep it from being addictive and highly replayable. It's Outrun with guns, so like, outgun. You control a red sports car with a mounted machine gun as it streaks down the highway, racing to reach the finish line before running out of fuel, dodging indestructible black sedans. You earn points by blasting yellow vehicles or motorcycles, and you can temporarily upgrade your weapons loadout by catching gun upgrades dropped into the fray by passing aerial drones. So like I said, it's basically Spy Hunter with a pitched perspective rather than an overhead one. The primary factor that sets Road Blasters apart is the need to collect fuel en route to the finish. By collecting the green and red orbs that appear along the highway, you replenish a touch of your precious fuel gauge. Run out of gas, and it's game over. The highway streaks past at high speeds, with targets and obstacles alike popping in suddenly, so Road Blaster demands a fair amount of skill and reflex. It has a decidedly old-school arcade feel to it, and not just in terms of its speed and challenge level either. Road Blaster begins with the same risk-reward proposition as vintage Atari arcade hits like Tempest. Do you start at a difficult advanced level and rake in a score bonus? Or do you begin from level one and play it safe while foregoing the extra points? This is a score chasing test of reflexes that has no greater pretenses. And its Lynx conversion is fantastic. If not for the massively reduced pixel resolution, you could honestly mistake the Lynx game for the arcade original. The colors and design of the graphics are reproduced accurately, and more importantly, the breathtaking sense of speed comes through perfectly as well. Okay, maybe not perfectly. The game is much easier here to read in RGB capture than it is on an actual Lynx screen, which is much smaller, much blurrier, and far more washed out. Still, on a technical level, Road Blasters does a great job of bringing the arcade experience into handheld form. It compares favorably with the Sega Genesis version, which is no small feat for a portable system. Atari sold Lynx on the prospect of a true arcade experience in your hands, and with its silky smooth action, Road Blasters is a rare case of Lynx living up to its billing. Okay, this last one is kind of cheating. Gauntlet the Third Encounter isn't a direct arcade port. It's more of a sequel. And by sequel, I mean entirely new, if derivative game in a new franchise, hastily rebranded for sales appeal. Gauntlet the Third Encounter infamously began life as a new epics project that was to be called Time Quests and Treasure Chests. It really shows. You should not read the name Gauntlet the Third Encounter to mean Gauntlet 3, because this game deviates significantly from the first two entries in the series in several ways. For starters, it's the second vertical Lynx game we've seen, even though the arcade gauntlets used a standard screen format. In this case, it seems more like a gimmick than a matter of necessity, as the main action window is a square, and the status bar that occupies the lower third of the screen could just as easily have been rotated 90 degrees and placed alongside the action. The vertical arrangement does highlight one of the curious additions to this game that hints at its non-gauntlet origins, a picture-in-picture -picture viewpoint of the dungeon. As players quest in the main window, which takes the same top-down format as the original gauntlet, a section of the status bar displays a rudimentary rendition of the player's perspective. Enemies and treasures ahead of the player on the upper screen appear in this window, scaling relative to their proximity to the player. It was hard to know what to make of this back in 1990, but 30 years later it feels like nothing so much as a rudimentary attempt to rework the top-down action of Gauntlet into a first-person dungeon shooter. 
The lower display lacks critical details, such as backgrounds, but it's an interesting thought. Probably more to the point, it neatly showcases Lynx's sprite scaling capabilities, which is even more impressive given the number of objects that can appear in the main window's combat scenes at the same time. It's worth noting that the main window ultimately displays fewer objects than you'd see in an actual Gauntlet game, though. Here we find another major discrepancy between legit Gauntlet and third encounter Gauntlet, enemy generators. A big part of the punishing brutality that defined Gauntlet and robbed children of so very many quarters and tokens came from the presence of enemy generators. You'd find these stationary objects scattered about the dungeon and they constantly spewed monsters. So unless you took the time to destroy the generators at considerable risk to yourself, you'd never be free of omnipresent waves of bad guys. Here, each stage has a fixed number of monsters, and once you take them out, you're done. The monsters can still be overwhelming, and your health still ticks down steadily even when you're not taking damage directly from contact with enemies, but there's ultimately an end, and therefore the opportunity to breathe, in sight. So, okay, it's not exactly Gauntlet, but it kind of does a decent bit of justice to the series. For starters, the third encounter makes use of the Comlinx communication cable to allow up to four people to play simultaneously. That's a pretty impressive proposition. Mindscape's NES adaptation of Gauntlet 2 shipped around the same time as the third encounter, and it required the use of a multi-tap accessory for four-person action. Lynx offered that feature right out of the box, though it did require four systems and four cards, so it wasn't exactly an economical proposition. Even more notably, the third encounter does a lot to change up the playable cast of the Gauntlet series. Where the first two games featured four playable character types, Warrior, Wizard, Valkyrie, Elf, the third encounter includes ten. As in the older games, characters have several stats to distinguish them from one another. Speed, Strength, and Missile. Speed determines the movement and rate of fire. Strength determines their endurance. And Missile indicates the potency of their basic projectile attacks. These characters range from incredibly useless, namely the nerd who has the poorest strength and missile stats, to incredibly useful, such as the gunslinger and the samurai, both of whom offer respectable speed and power. The other new classes include a punk rocker, a pirate whose projectile is in fact a parrot, and an android that some allege Google ripped off for its mobile OS mascot. These different characters go a long way toward encouraging replay and mixing things up with multiplayer sessions. They don't make up for the lack of randomization and dynamic monster generation that you would expect in a Gauntlet game, but they do give the third encounter a bit of personality. That said, despite the attempt to do something interesting with the Gauntlet formula, the third encounter doesn't quite rise to the standards of a proper entry in the series. It's plagued by its limited design, and it's generally awkward. Enemies rush at you, but the monsters you face from the very first level take multiple hits to destroy for even the most powerful character types, which makes it difficult to avoid soaking up tons of damage. The weaker characters basically have no chance at all. The controls feel stiff, while enemies can maneuver easily, diagonally, even through walls, and the first person picture in picture doesn't compensate for the uncomfortable zoomed in point of view. Worse, you have to babysit your inventory beginning with the second level. Everything you collect, including individual bags of gold, count against your encumbrance, forcing you to constantly juggle keys and other tools. It's a messy game that surely means well, but it just doesn't work. I can see that it may be more balanced and entertaining when played with other people, but it's not exactly an easy matter to find three other Lynx owners who want to pick up a game of Gauntlet these days. Altogether, these four games make a mostly strong case for Lynx as a destination for home renditions of Atari's arcade hits. It's hard to argue that Atari arcade games had a lot of cachet in 1990, as the arcade in general had badly waned in appeal. The kids were more interested in Super Mario Bros. or Final Fight than in Rampart. But for the weirdos who did prefer Rampart, Lynx was hard to beat. A console that compared favorably in power with Sega Genesis, on the go, with loving renditions of popular arcade games. Easy as it is to poo-poo the links in hindsight, it's important to remember just how impressive it was in its time. And thanks in large part to games like these.